Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Brendan Lucia from the University of Washington. He's a grad student uh, working with Professor Luis Cezé, who, and he's finishing up this year. He's done work, I think, with a number of people in this room before, and um, he's going to give a talk on his uh, PhD research. So, Brendan. Cool. All right, thanks, Jim, for the introduction. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about my research on using architecture and system support to make concurrent and parallel software more correct and more reliable. So uh, as you mentioned, this is the work I've done during my PhD um, at the University of Washington uh, with my advisor, Luis Cezé. So uh, I'm going to begin my talk today by talking about what are the key challenges that I've looked at in my research. And the key challenges that I've focused on are those posed by concurrency and parallelism, and in particular, what the impact of concurrency and parallelism is on the problems of correctness and reliability. Then I'm going to dive into the key research themes that show up in my approach to solving these research challenges. And the, the focus of my work is on using architecture and system support to solve these problems. Then after that, I'll dive into a couple of my research contributions in some more detail to give you an idea for the kind of projects that I like to work on. Um, and at the end of my talk, I'm going to talk about some of the things that I'm interested in uh, in the future going forward. So first, I'll talk about the key research challenges that I've looked at. So, I'm going to show you now that concurrency and parallelism are essential uh, and they're unavoidable. Um, and there are two main reasons why concurrency and parallelism are essential and unavoidable. And that is that there's pressure from the bottom uh, because technology is changing and there's pressure from the top because the applications that people care about running on computers uh, are changing. So I'll talk about technology first. The best example of a change in technology is the shift to multi-core devices. Everyone has a multi-core in their phone and in their, in their laptop um, and everywhere else. In order to get uh, energy efficient and high performance computation out of a multi-core, you need software that exposes parallelism down to the multi-core. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum, we have warehouse scale computers. These are the things that run our data centers and to fully utilize these and get energy efficiency and, uh, and uh, performance, you also need to write software that maps computation across all the nodes in a data center. So we see a need for parallelism because of the shift in technology. This is also true because of the shift in applications that we're seeing. So we have mobile applications and server and cloud applications are two examples of this. In mobile devices, we have little devices, they run on a multi-core, and they're powered off a battery. In order to get energy efficient computation out of a multi-core, you need software that utilizes that multi-core. Um, and that kind of software requires that there's parallelism to map down to the, to the multi-core. So mobile applications demand this especially because energy efficiency is important when you're running off a battery. And in server and cloud domain, you're running on warehouse scale computers. So you need parallelism to get performance. In addition, there's also some concurrency constraints here. Mobile applications need to communicate with cloud applications. And uh, in cloud and server applications, you need to coordinate sharing of resource, resources across uh, simultaneous client requests. So there's really a need because of these applications for concurrency and parallelism. So there is a need, but why is that an interesting research question? So to talk about that, we can look back at the model that we have. Uh, we're all familiar with this model for sequential programs. In a sequential program, there's one thread of control. And execution hops through that thread of control by doing a series of steps like A and then B and then C. And if you're a good programmer, you write your software and then you give it an input and you run the program and you see what the output is. And if you try enough inputs and you see enough outputs that match the specification that you have in your head or you have written down somewhere, then you can put that software out in the world and have some assurance that it's correct. However, uh, the story is different when we look at multi-threaded software. Multi-threaded software, uh, shared memory multi-threading, um, is the most common idiom these days for writing concurrent and parallel programs. In multi-threaded software, there's not just a single thread of control. There's multiple threads of control. And they can interact by uh, sharing, reading and, uh, reading and writing a shared memory space, and explicitly synchronizing with one another to order events in different threads. Any events in different threads that aren't explicitly ordered with synchronization execute independently. This leads to what we call the non-deterministic thread interleaving problem. The non-deterministic thread interleaving problem manifests in the following way. If we take this program and we give it an input and we run it and we see its output, 
um, we might get one output on the first execution with that input. If we take the same input, run the program again, we could get a different output. And the reason is that independent operations in different threads could execute in any order in those executions, potentially changing the result of the computation. So the non-deterministic thread interleaving problem has several implications. The first is that these programs are hard to write. They're hard to write because it's hard to understand how different interleavings of independent operations will impact the execution of the program. These programs are hard to debug. Bugs might only manifest as failures in some program executions. And when they do, it's hard to reason about what the effects were that actually led to the failure. And finally, testing these programs uh, is currently infeasible because testing requires uh, looking not just at the space of all possible inputs, but also at the space of all possible interleavings. Although there have been some advances in recent years in the area of testing multi-threaded software by some people in the room. So it's getting better, but at the moment, it's still infeasible to comprehensively test um, these programs. And just to show you, this is not an academic day daydream. This isn't just something we do in the lab. Uh, here are three examples from recent headlines that illustrate that um, concurrency bugs cause problems in the real world. We've seen infrastructure failures, security holes that have led to uh, millions of dollars being stolen, Amazon web services went down. So this is a serious problem, and th these problems were all the result of concurrency errors in software. So they're difficult to write, they're hard to debug, and they're infeasible to fully test. So bugs are going to find their way into production systems and cause those kinds of problems. What we want is that these programs are simple to write. We want them to be easier to debug, so when we have bugs we can fix them, and we want them to be reliable, despite the fact that we can't comprehensively test them and bugs might find their way into production systems. So I've just identified three key research challenges, programmability, debugging, and failure avoidance. And these are the challenges that I've looked at uh, during the work that I've done in my thesis. So now I'm going to talk about the themes that show up in my approach to solving those key research challenges. There are four key themes that I'm going to talk about. The first is looking at system and architecture support across the system stack. Second, I'll look at uh, designing new abstractions that allow us to develop new analyses. Third, I'm interested in systems that leverage the behavior of collections of machines. And finally, um, I'm interested in mechanisms that are useful not just during development, but for the lifetime of a system. <clears throat> so first I'll talk about my approach to using architecture and system support. So many people see this slide and they see the word architecture here and they think, well, this guy works on hardware. Hardware is part of architecture, but the way that I think about architecture is that Hardware is where the architecture begins. And we have to think about the interaction between hardware and the compiler, and the compiler and the operating system, and the hardware and language runtimes, and programming languages, and software engineering tools, and even things at the application level, like statistical models of the behavior of a program. So my approach to architectural support is to look across the entire system stack. The second theme that I'm going to talk about is the use of new program abstractions that allow us to develop new analyses that are, are more powerful. And an example, uh, more powerful than, than prior work for solving some problems. And an example of uh, a new abstraction from my work um, is the use of something called a context-aware communication graph. I'm going to describe this in more detail later, but I'm showing you now because uh, this is an abstraction. Context-aware communication graphs correspond to the interactions between threads that occur when a program is executing. And this is important because it allowed us to develop a new analysis that helped us to find bugs that are the result, uh, to find concurrency bugs uh, better than prior techniques. The third theme is that I like to take advantage of the behavior of collections of systems. And the way that I do this is by uh, collecting data in and individual machines and incorporating it together into models that help us find bugs when they show up as anomalies, help us to predict where failures might happen, to avoid failures, um, and to feed information back to the programmer so they have a, a better set of data to work from when they're trying to fix bugs. And finally, I'm interested in systems that remain useful, not just during development, but also in deployment for the lifetime of the system. So uh, we've developed mechanisms that help during debugging, and these have remained useful in deployment because they feed information from deployment machines back to developers. Failure avoidance mechanisms are useful during deployment because they continue to provide value when systems are running in production. So I'm interested in these kinds of mechanisms, especially when they're hardware mechanisms that provide, uh, provide benefit for the lifetime of a system. So 
uh, I've used these th themes to address these key research challenges, and my publication record shows that I've worked in all three of these areas. It also shows that I've worked across the layers of the system stack. I have papers that showed up at Micro and ISCA, which are architecture conferences, but also at Uppsala, which is a programming systems conference, and PLDI, which is a conference on programming language design and implementation. I'd like to talk about all three of these today, uh, but unfortunately I'll only have time to talk about my work on debugging and failure avoidance. And I'm going to do that now by jumping into uh, two of my research contributions in more detail to give you an idea for the projects that I've done in those two areas. And there are two, two efforts that I'm going to focus on. Uh, the first is a project called Recon. This is a project in which we used architecture and system support to make it easier to debug concurrent programs. And the second is a system called Aviso. Aviso is a technique that helps that enables production systems to cooperate by sharing information so that they can avoid failures that are the result of concurrency errors. So I'll talk about recon first. And if the lighting was a little better in here, uh, you'd, so recon is a technique for finding bugs in programs. And if the lighting was better, you'd see that on this antelope there are birds that are finding the bugs and, and pulling them out of the, the antelope's fur. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So to un what's that? Is that what you're advocating for? Yeah, that's actually that's my future work section. I'm going to see if we can recruit pigeons that are a nuisance in the cities if we can put them to work. Um, so uh, in order to understand a technique that helps with concurrency debugging, I unfortunately need everyone to just read a little bit of code. The code's pretty simple. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I, I know how much everyone loves reading code, but it's, it's, it's going to help a lot. So there are three threads in the program. Uh, the program's pretty simple. Green is setting some flag called ready equal to true. Uh, and then it's setting a shared object pointer equal to some new object. Blue checks that flag to see if it's true and then takes a copy of that shared object pointer. Now the programmer, when they wrote this, they had this invariant in mind. Whenever ready is true, shared object is going to be a valid pointer. You can see that they've implemented this incorrectly if you are good at reading this kind of bubbles on slides code. Um, what blue does with that pointer that it copied is to put it into this queue called queue that it shares with the red thread. The red thread dequeues objects from the queue and uses them. OK. So the program executes like that, and what happens? We see that green sets ready to true. Blue sees that ready is true and takes a copy of that pointer. But green hasn't set the pointer to a new object yet. So it has an invalid pointer at this point. It enqueues the invalid pointer, and then red uses the invalid pointer when it dequeues it from that queue. So what's interesting about this bug is that the root cause is over here in the interaction between blue and green. But the failure manifests over here in red. And that makes this a very difficult error to debug. Luckily, there's been a lot of prior work in debugging this kind of error. One category of prior work is work that uses program traces to debug these kinds of errors. And program traces are big lists of everything that happened during a program's execution. The programmer can look at this list of things that happened, starting from the point of the failure, and hopefully, eventually, they get back to the point in the execution where the root cause happened. And these techniques are effective, but they're limited in one way. And that is, if the execution <coughs> is very long, and there's a large distance between the root cause of the bug and the failure, like you, this could be several days, then the trace is going to be huge. And the programmer is going to have to look at gigabytes of stuff to try and figure out what's wrong with the program. So these techniques are useful, but they give too much information. So there's been other techniques that try to help debugging by focusing in on a narrow subset of the operations uh, that happen during the execution. And these are techniques that, debug, uh, that uh, help to debug using dependence information. So dependencies occur when uh, operations access the same piece of memory, like the green and the blue thread are, are at both accessing this ready variable. Um, and these techniques are useful because they focus in on just the operations that the, the programmer might care about. But in fact, they sometimes give too little information. Like you can see here, uh, these operations are dependent, so they might be selected in one of these techniques. But they don't tell the whole story. They don't include uh, information about the accesses to the shared object variable. And that would be important for understanding why this bug happened. So what we want to do is develop a technique that gives neither too little nor too much information. We want to show the programmer the root cause, but we don't want to distract them. And we want to take a cue from those dependence-based techniques. And we want to give the programmer information about communication. Communication is inter-thread dependence. When one thread writes a, a variable, and another thread reads or overwrites that, that's when we have communication. So we want to show the programmer when that happens, too. So our goal 
is to develop a debugging methodology that can reconstruct the root cause of failures. We want to include all the code that's involved in the root cause, and we want to show it to the programmer in time order, and we want to give them the information about the communication that occurred. When we do that, we have a reconstructed execution fragment, and that's one of the main contributions of this work. These reconstructed execution fragments are actually derived from a model of inter-thread communication that we also developed in this work. Can I ask a question, Yeah, absolutely. I have a straw man proposal for solving this problem. Say again? I have a straw man proposal for solving this problem. Okay, what is it? The proposal is you ask the programmer to write down the invariant that you mentioned. And then check it. And then check it dynamically. And will fail exactly at, the, mm -hmm. at that window. So the problem is that the programmer often doesn't really know that invariant explicitly. They have it sort of implicitly in their brain. Mm -hmm. And I think often programmers haven't thought far enough ahead to really encode that and crystallize it and put it down in code. There's also the problem of asking people to express invariants in code. Um, which can sometimes be complicated. Actually writing these things, that was a simple invariant, but invariants could be much more complicated. You could have uh, pre and post conditions on API entry points, and you could have data structure invariants that are, that are not so simple to express. Um, that work is complementary, though. I think that's a great idea. I wish people would do that. <laughs> so. Cool. Yeah, feel free to interrupt if you have questions. Uh, we have a fairly long time slot, and uh, we, can, we can talk in, in the middle of the talk if you like. Okay. So we want a debugging methodology that produces those reconstructed execution fragments. And here's an overview of the methodology that we developed in this work. The first step is that the program crashes and someone sends a bug report to the developer. The developer looks in the bug report and sees that there's some bug triggering input. And they use our tool to run the program repeatedly with that bug triggering input. Our tool generates communication graphs, in particular context-aware communication graphs, which I mentioned a little earlier in my talk, and I'm going to explain in detail in just a second. Having produced a set of context-aware communication graphs for many executions, the programmer labels each of them as having come from a program execution that manifested the failure or did not, so buggy or not buggy. Then our tool takes that set of labeled communication graphs and it builds a set of reconstructions that might help the programmer understand the bug. And the last step is to look at that set of reconstructions and assign a rank to each one so the programmer knows which one is most likely to be beneficial to look at when they're trying to figure out why a failure happened. Okay, so now I'm going to go through each of those steps uh, in a little more detail, starting with what communication graphs are and how we build them. So communication, as I said a second ago, happens when one thread writes a value to memory and another thread reads or overwrites that value. We can pretty naturally represent that as a graph where the nodes are static program points and edges exist between nodes whenever two instructions have executed during the execution. So we have the source, the sync, and we have shared memory communication indicated by the edge. If we do that, we have what we would call a simple static communication graph. Static because the nodes represent static program instructions. And in fact, this is a little too simple. The way that it's too simple is that uh, representing uh, static program instructions in this graph doesn't differentiate between different dynamic instances of the same program instruction. So if you're going around a loop, the first iteration of the loop is the same as the second, and so forth. Whereas for understanding why a bug happened, it might be interesting to differentiate between ex uh, uh, instructions executing in different contexts. To get around that, we could look at a dynamic communication graph. In a dynamic communication graph, every different dynamic instance of a static instruction would be differentiated. So the way to think about this is there's some monotonically increasing instruction counter Whenever an instruction executes, it adds a node to the graph that's identified by the instruction address and that counter. This is essentially a program trace. And the main, so while this gets around the problem with the static graphs, the problem with this is that it's unbounded. So we end up with that too much information problem that we had before. In this work, we developed a middle ground between the simple static graph and the unbounded dynamic graph. And we called that a context-aware communication graph. The key idea in a context-aware communication graph is that a node represents a static instruction executing in a particular, particular communication context. We add communication context to the nodes. The communication context encodes abstractly a short history of communication events that preceded the instruction represented by that node. So if there's some sequence of communication events and then an instruction executes, that's one node in the graph. If there's a different sequence of communication events and then that same instruction executes, it's another node in the graph. So we differentiate between different instances of static instructions. Sure. So 
question. So okay. if I have a loop with the instruction in there, I could have multiple instances of the instruction with the same <coughs> communication graph label. If, uh, if the communication is, is outside the loop, say. Yeah, so if you are in a loop and the there's no communication taking place, then you would add multiple instances of that instruction. I mean, in practice, the graph doesn't grow. The node is already there, so we don't add anything. Okay. okay. And what communication you mean uh, shared memory communication? Yeah, I mean shared memory communication in the way that I described before. When one thread writes a value and another thread reads or overwrites it, that's when communication occurs. That's, and yeah. Semaphores and all the other locks and all those other things, how do they do Mm -hmm. So those would show up as, so the, the question was whether synchronization operations would show up in the communication graph. Um, and in fact they would because they manipulate pieces of shared memory. So uh, as you'll see in my implementation, we, we uh, instrument programs at a very low level and we have another implementation which uses hardware support. So we're observing the execution from a very low level of abstraction and all these things look similar. They look like shared memory operations. Sure. Should I think of these labels as being like logical clocks? Uh, no, I would think of them a little more like uh, calling context uh, in a compiler analysis, but instead of being calling context, we're looking at communication context. So rather than abstractly encoding a call stack, we're abstractly encoding the sequence of communication operations that preceded this operation. Did that help? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm still, I'm, I'm trying to understand what's wrong with the logical clock analysis, like in a distributed system where, you have, where each node maintains a clock based on messages in sequence. So, I can, there is you're encoding the communication that's happened. It seems like the same. It seems like it should be a dual. Uh, they encode similar information. Um, this, I expect, is cheaper to implement, which is uh, one of the reasons that we, that we did it this way, because we only have to do things when things actually share, not preemptively on other operations. So, yeah. so, going back to the same question. Sure. Um, so, I'm still trying to understand what you mean by preceding. So, for T9, the communication. T9, let's say, uh, T equals 9, that red a value that's written by T equals 4. So you put the green dot there. So the, the green uh, dot, yeah, so uh, I was hoping to gloss over those details, but I can get into those details now. So the, the entries that go into the context are uh, indicators that say a local read or write happened, a, a, a read or write that didn't communicate, or a remote read or write happened meaning that a read or write happened which did. So that's how we abstract. We abstract away the addresses. Oh, so you don't know where you read it from, but it's, you know that it's a, re it's a remote. Right? We know that it's a remote read. So you can actually think of it, uh, our motivation for getting to this abstraction was thinking about coherence. So if preceding some operation, there was an incoming coherence request that showed that some other processor had written to some piece of memory, that would, be, that would populate one entry in the communication context. So that might be a, another way of helping to think about it, is local operations are just you know, memory operations, and remote operations are incoming coherence requests. And so one more question. So sure. Let's say t equals 50 was not, uh, was not accessing the same variable as t equals 9. They were accessing different variables. Mm -hmm. Even then, you would put the communication of the previous instruction in the context of t equals 50. That's correct. Yeah, okay. so the, so the context. Is both Local, mm -hmm. it is in, intra intra thread happens before and inter thread communication. Mm -hmm. Right. You can think of the context as a thread local property. The context is always being updated, and whenever a node gets added to the graph by a particular thread, you grab the current context and you add it to the node. And then the context changes, and you add another node and you grab the new context. Okay. Context is bad. It's a sort of like um, K limiting. And sort of call graph analysis. Exactly, yeah. You're going to go back. So if I think of it as a happens before graph dynamically, you have a compression technique that is doing basically paths of length k, mm -hmm. and that sort of, that now becomes your context for identifying a node as unique. Absolutely. In your graph. That's a great way to think about it, it is, is as uh, an analogy to k bounded uh, calling context. That's, that's the perfect way to think about it. That's the way I think about it. So, Okay, I'm going to move on just so I can uh, get through all the content here. So, Yeah, I suppose, yeah, I suppose I have time. Yeah, so. <laughs> okay, so I just described how we build these context-aware communication graphs. Now I'm going to talk about how we go from communication graphs to these things called reconstructed execution fragments, which I described a second ago. So to build a reconstruction, we start with an edge from the communication graph. And I've omitted the context just so the diagrams are simpler. 
Okay, then, uh, oh, you know what? I forgot to mention something just a second ago because we got in that discussion. Uh, one more thing that we add to this graph is a, a form of bounded timestamp. Um, and the way that these works is not especially, uh, it's not especially interesting. It's a monotonically increasing counter that we update in a lossy way so the representation remains bounded. Um, so we start with one of these edges, and then we want to build a reconstruction. So we can look at those lossy timestamps that I just described, and we can populate three regions of a reconstruction, the prefix, body, and the suffix. And we populate those regions based on those timestamps. So uh, to populate the body, for example, we look at operations that showed up in the graph that had timestamps between the timestamp on this source node and the one on this sync node. And we do the same for the, for the prefix um, and the suffix. So building reconstructions is very straightforward. Yep. Uh, I don't think I understand your question. So, and while explaining the previous slides, you said that you don't have information as to uh, which thread you read it from, other than the fact that it was a remote read. That is, you mm -hmm. read a value mm -hmm. that was remotely written by somebody. Yeah, so yeah. there's, we keep a distinction between the entries in the context, which are abstracted, and the entry, and the nodes in the graph. So a node is uh, the tuple of a static instruction address and the communication context in which it executed. So you know which operation it was. That's how you know if it was a read or a write. You know which one? Okay. For, for the arrow, right? So you know that the blue box was actually a read of some read of X. Or overwrite, yeah. And it was a remote read. That is, it, it read something that was the, the, the write of X by somebody else, some other thread. But That's you correct. don't know which thread it was. Uh, we actually do. We, we keep track of that. Um, we don't record that in the graph, though. Um, so in our implementation, we need to keep track of that because we need to be able to identify when remotes, uh, reads and writes are remote. Um, but the graph abstracts away threads. And that's actually important for remaining bounded. Because if you think of applications that have thousands of threads, like something that's built with coroutines, um, then it might be a scalability problem for our representation if we actually encoded the thread in the graph. Did that answer your question? Good. OK. This, this graph makes it look like the, the time is um, essentially se sequencing everything. But can you have? multiple instructions happening at the same time? Uh, yes, but our timestamps are sort of a, they're sort of a cheap implementation of timestamps. Um, and so we have this monotonically increasing counter that gets updated lossily. So we don't do that, but you very easily could. You could think about things that happen concurrently and use that as the, as the timestamp instead. The reason we did this was as a convenience in our implementation because we actually had, sure. Yeah, so we use the uh, real time, uh, the, uh, what's it called? Intel timestamp counter uh, instruction. So you can have multiple instructions happening at the same time, at the uh, same time stamp on different processors. Yes, due to imprecision in that counter, yes, you could. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand, like this, this picture makes it look like everything is uh, serialized. I'm trying to understand if you mm -hmm. have to construct an arbitrary serialization of all the instructions across all the different processors, or whether your timestamp just gives that to you? The timestamp <coughs> gives us the serialization. Okay. Yeah, the time, think of it as a system-wide time that we're using to populate this. Okay, then I don't understand how you can't end up with multiple instructions occurring at exactly the same time. I mean, are ETSC on two machines would have the same value, okay? Yeah, right. so I guess because of, the, because, of the, because of the precision in that thing, I guess, yeah, because of concurrency and, and imprecision uh, in that counter, it's possible. Um, I've omitted that because I, I don't think it's an especially important detail. But you're right that that could happen. Um, if things did have the same timestamp, uh, because they happened on two processors that had the same counter, um, they would end up in the same region of the reconstruction. So you wouldn't necessarily know the ordering across those things, but you'd know which region they showed up in. Um, there's something I'm going to get to which makes it less important to know uh, ordering within a region. Yeah, and I'll show you that in just a second. We, and I'll come back to your question when I get there if you want. Yeah. Um, so it's actually this right here. So the reason that that's not especially important is that we take, so th one of the big problems with uh, dealing with concurrency errors is that you get different behavior from one execution to the next. And that means you get different reconstructions from one execution to the next, even if you start with the same communication graph edge. So we have a way of aggregating reconstructions together that came from different executions. And obviously, from different executions, there will be substantially different and incomparable timestamps. 
So the way that we produce an ordering that we show to the programmer eventually is by aggregating across executions and combining things that occurred in the same region of the reconstruction. So the in, this is why I was sort of hedging around that question because I was going to get to this. It, it only matters that they end up in the right region of the reconstruction. Yeah. And then we know ordering prefix things happen before source and source happen before body and so forth. So, so in the reconstruction, the, the, on the right hand side of the equal sign, the, the blue and the green oval that are sort of parallel to each other means one of those occurred. Both of those occurred, either of them could occur. What's the semantics of this? So there's something else that I'm leaving out of this diagram for simplicity, because usually I smoke through this in about 10 minutes. But I, no, no, that's fine. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll add more details. So um, in our actual implementation, these things come with confidence values. And the confidence value says, this happened in 50%, and this happened in 50%. Or this happened in 99.999%, and this happened in 1% of executions. It means, so we build reconstructions from, gra from graph edges that came from graph is, graphs from failing executions. And so if we see green in 99.999% of the body regions from failing executions, then we can have some confidence that when the program fails, whether this is significant or not is, is something else that we decide, but when the program fails, that thing tends to happen between the source and the sink. Very often happens between the source and the sink. So that's what that confidence value gives us. Okay. okay? Yeah, question in the back. So are these independent probabilities though? Because it could be that, you know, like 50% of the time green happens and 50% of the time blue happens, but they never occur together. Mm -hmm. right? So there's no dependence encoded in this probability, is that correct? No, we're not we're not encoding independence. We're treating them as independent. Sorry, I probably just went out of the range of the camera. So, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I've just talked about how we build reconstructions starting with those graphs. Talked about how we aggregate reconstructions from different executions. Now I'm going to talk about how we figure out which reconstructions are actually useful. Um, we do that by representing reconstructions as a vector of numeric valued features. And each of those features represents a different property of the reconstructions. Using the values of those features, we can compute a rank for each of the reconstructions. So our tool works by generating lots of reconstructions, computing these feature vectors, computing a rank, and then ranking the reconstructions that were produced. Our goal is to produce a rank-ordered list of reconstructions where the first one in that list is one that points the programmer to the root cause of the bug. So what you're probably all wondering is what are B, C, and R? What are those features? So I'm not going to talk about all of them, um, but I'll talk about one to give you an intuition for how the features work to help us figure out which reconstructions are related to a bug. So one of the features that we use is something that we call the buggy frequency ratio. And the intuition is this. You build a reconstruction around a graph edge. If the graph edge occurs often, in failing executions and occurs very rarely in non-failing executions, then we assume that that graph edge might have something to do with the failure. And so we improve the rank of reconstructions built around that edge. And conversely, if the thing, if this were the other way and this graph edge were to happen often in non-failing executions and, uh, and uh, often in non-failing executions and rarely in failing executions, then we would say, well, that's probably not very useful for understanding the bug. And so we would give that reconstruction a lower rank. So that's the intuition behind uh, the features. And the other features encode similar, uh, similar ideas, but for different properties of the reconstructions. Sure. Again, going back to my previous question, yes. this doesn't encode or capture bugs that occur when two things happen together, in some sense, because these are independent. So yeah, so one of the other features that we look at um, okay. looks at the consistency of things happening in a particular region of the reconstruction. And that captures that two things, that, that idea that two things happen at once. So if, uh, maybe we should, yeah, maybe we can talk about this later, because I, I think it would be easier to talk about it offline than to try and get into it without a whiteboard right now. So, yeah, one of our other features does, does capture that property, though. Okay. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about our implementation. Um, and our implementation, Sure, yeah. So, so how dependent are you on the quality of labels of buggy, non-buggy? Because you could have a non-buggy run where the bug has just not caused a crash. Yeah, we are completely and absolutely dependent on that property. And something that I'm really interested in in my future work is to uh, make systems that can tell you earlier than we know now that something has gone wrong. And I think that's actually a very hard problem in general. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk about implementation. Our implementation, uh, we started with a software implementation. Um, we used binary instrumentation uh, for C++, we used PIN, and for Java, we used Roadrunner. Um, and our instrumentation is simple. We inject code around memory operations, and the code that we inject updates a data structure that represents the communication graph. So you can go to my website, and you can download this stuff now, and you can use it if you want to. Um, and that makes it 
pretty cool in my opinion because it's practical and you can go and run it on your machine. Um, the downside is that using binary instrument instrumentation uh, is a little bit of a bummer because the overhead can range between 50% for some applications to like 100x. Um, so obviously 100x slowdown is a little bit of a drag, but if you look at tools like Valgrind, uh, you see overheads that are actually similar for some applications. So it's high, but it's not unreasonable. People actually use Valgrind in, in practical software development. Um, so we saw those overheads, and we were encouraged because it was usable, but we wanted it to go faster. And so we looked at how we could use hardware support um, to make graph collection more efficient. And our base design for our hardware support mechanisms was a multi-core processor that has coherent data caches. I'm going to add some things to this design, and they'll show up in blue. And those are the extensions that we proposed. The first extension that we proposed is uh, communication metadata. Communication metadata is information that we add to each of the lines in the cache. Um, in particular, we record what was the last instruction to access each cache line. Um, that's enough information to, uh, that's the information that processors need uh, to build the communication graph. We extended the cache coherence protocol um, to shuttle our communication metadata around, and that's useful uh, for the following reason. Cache coherence protocol messages are sent between processors when communication is taking place in the application. So if we attach our communication metadata to coherence protocol messages and a processor receives an incoming coherence message, they know that communication is happening and they know the instruction with which the communication is happening. So they can actually, using that information, build an edge that they can add to the graph. Yep? When you say instruction, do you mean the IP or? The instruction point, yeah. OK. Not your previous thing where you have a, a, a like. Yeah, I was doing that for illustrative it's purposes. Like looping stuff, you still identify each instruction just by IP. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I think I lost you. Yeah. Right, right back at the beginning about the problem of the static, identifying instructions statically versus dynamically. Ah, oh, right. So the context is part of our hardware support. I've left it out of this diagram because usually I actually find that I don't get into this much detail in the discussion. I'm really glad you guys are asking the question. This is more fun than the normal talks that I give where everyone's just silent. Um, but the context is part of that. Okay, so you also okay. have some additional information. We have, yeah, we, we keep the context on the core. So uh, in the metadata, it's actually instruction context tuple that gets stored. Um, right, and we also add a simple hardware structure to store the communication graph. That's a fixed size FIFO. Um, and it's fixed size, so when it reaches capacity, uh, software trap happens. We have a runtime layer that empties it out, stores it in memory, and you can use it during debugging. We have a software tool that does all the other stuff that I described a minute ago. Sure. So you have to worry about false sharing here, right, in some sense? Yeah, absolutely. So false sharing means that we're going to see communication that didn't really happen, and cache evictions mean that we don't see communication that might have happened and things, things get out of date. Um, so that's some imprecision, and we have numbers on that in our paper. We showed that it's not a huge problem for debugging, but yeah, it does show up as a problem. Software implementation. Did you guys look at uh, in your compiler analysis, or did you have any kind of a compiler analysis that looked at code and said, "Hey, this is a I can guarantee this is threat local," versus not? In which case, uh, no. But we cheated a little bit and we uh, excluded stack locations, assuming that they wouldn't be shared. Um, in, ja in Java, that's reasonable. In C++, people can do whatever they want to, uh, but we find that common practice is not to do that, so we omitted those accesses. Okay, now I'll just uh, talk about some of our evaluation. So we built, we built uh, that tool and we simulated that hardware, and I'm going to talk about how we evaluated that. Um, so if we had just built a compiler, now, a compiler optimization, um, we could take some program, use our optimization, and show that our optimization makes it go lots faster. Um, evaluating this was a little less straightforward. So we had to come up with a measure of uh, what was the quality of our technique. Um, and we measured quality by looking in that, uh, that rank-ordered list of reconstructions that Recon produces. The quality is higher if an earlier entry in that rank ordered list points us to the root cause of the bug. And the quality is lower if there are more things ahead of that root cause reconstruction that don't have anything to do with the root cause. We also looked at performance, which is just the runtime overhead. And we looked at some of the uh, hardware overheads as well. Um, for benchmarks, this was also kind of a challenge. And uh, I guess like you, some of you in the room can probably empathize with me here. Um, finding tools, uh, finding uh, programs to evaluate uh, concurrency debugging tools uh, can be a real challenge because there's no standard benchmark suite. So we actually went to the web and we found programs like MySQL, Apache, uh, Java Standard Library, things like that. Um, and we found bug triggering inputs and we reproduced those bugs and we showed that our tool can actually lead us to the root cause of the failures that the bugs uh, trigger. We evaluated performance using a set of standard benchmarks, Parsec, Decapo, and, and Java Grande. So uh, here is a high level summary of the results that we found when we evaluated the quality of our system. The first was that using a set, uh, a reasonably sized set of 
graphs from buggy and non-buggy executions, 25 was the number, um, we found that a reconstruction of the bug's root cause was first in that rank ordered list that recon outputs. Um, that was nice because it shows that with a modest amount of effort devoted to collecting graphs, um, the programmer is led to uh, the, the root cause of the bug. Um, we also identified a trade-off with respect to effort, and that trade-off was the following. If the programmer uses more graphs, then the quality is higher. If the programmer uses fewer graphs, they spend less time collecting graphs, but the quality is lower. So they might have to spend time looking through uh, what are effectively false positives in the output. Sure. So does it matter what fraction of the 25 are buggy? Oh, right. So that was 25 buggy and 25 non-buggy. So 50, 50. 50. 50 in total, so yeah. Suppose, it was, suppose the bug didn't occur all the time and it was, you know, uh, 10, 40. So uh, we actually, in the experiments that we used to illustrate this trade-off, uh, we used 5 or 15 buggy graphs, assuming that it was harder to get buggy executions, and 25 correct graphs, because correct graphs are essentially in limitless abundance. Okay. Um, our performance evaluation, we showed 10 to 100 times overhead in software, like I said before. Um, pretty high, but comparable to other tools. Um, and there are two sources of hardware overhead that we found interesting. One is, how often do those traps happen, where you have to empty out the FIFO and store it in memory? And two is, uh, how often do you need to update the metadata that's hanging on the end of the cache line? So we found that traps are pretty infrequent. This is le less than one in 10 million on average. Smiling and have a question. What's well, up? <laughs> you, you hope the traps are infrequent, but what, what, what I would argue matters more is how long does it take you to handle the trap and empty out the FIFO, and what's that overhead on the overall performance? Yeah, so I, I don't have numbers on that. Um, we could talk about that later. Um, but the infrequency helps to amortize that cost, but you're right. I mean, it's, it's really the, the increase in latency that could be a problem, yeah. Um, and the second result is, uh, how often do we have to update that metadata? Because that could be a problem. And you'll see that this is considerably more frequent. 2% of memory operations is fairly often. However, in a hardware implementation, this can happen in parallel with accessing the cache line itself. So it's not likely to be a performance problem because it can be parallelized. Okay, so just to summarize those themes that I described. So er, per cache line or per, per cache line. For cache line. Yeah, and it's, it's imprecise because of that. Yep. We have an analysis of that in our paper if you're interested in checking that out. Yeah. Um, so I just showed you that uh, we developed some new abstractions, context-aware communication graphs, and we used those to build reconstructed execution fragments. Uh, there was support across the system stack. Uh, I showed you a hardware and software implementation, and I, sh I showed you in our results some of the trade-offs of using each of those. Um, this is a system that is useful uh, even in deployment because with a hardware implementation, we can collect this information all the time and send it back to developers. Um, and finally, this system uh, takes advantage of collective behavior because information could be pooled from many systems that run the same piece of software and the information can be combined. So uh, that's what I have to say about Recon. This is a new uh, architecture and system support mechanism for making concurrency debugging easier. Okay, uh, yep, questions. I'm just I'm starting to look at the time a little bit. We have been doing a lot of questions. I, I want to make sure I, I do get through everything without keeping everything. You have time. I don't want to, okay, sure. Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm curious, uh, <laughs> if I did something really dumb, like yeah. for instance, uh, I just record the last thread that access a particular variable, and kept that as my uh, kind of straw man that said this, this is where the potential bug, this is the IP of the source of, of where of the, the root cause of a bug could occur. So, I, okay, what I'm trying to get at is, did you guys do any kind of analysis where you had some sort of a baseline that said that, you know, you have a very complicated system. Is there any kind of baseline where you have some comparison that says, you know, something simpler like the straw man that Shaw said mm -hmm. at the beginning? Yeah. Doesn't so, actually do something as, you know, real to be as well. Right. So. We didn't do that, um, but something I would really like to do in the future is to actually get some human subjects into the lab and say, debug using technique A, debug sure. using technique B, and do a comparison. And maybe not even just across the work that I've done, but across work that has come from other groups. I think it would be a really informative study to see which techniques are actually uh, good. And it might involve collaborating with some HCI people, because that's a little bit outside of my area of expertise, but it could be really interesting to see those results. Okay. Yeah, so. I had exactly the same question. Cool. OK, well, yeah, so that's my answer. And I would love to see more human subject studies going on in this area of research. I just, you don't see that many, and I think it'd be really cool to see more of those. So, all right, now I'm going to change gears and I'm going to talk about a system that isn't about finding and fixing bugs for a programmer, but rather it's about systems cooperating to learn how to automatically avoid failures. Um, and you can see, just like these buffalo are all looking outward, they're cooperating to avoid failures, which would be lion attacks or something in this example. <laughs> So these photos are in here. I, I took a trip to Zimbabwe, so I've got a bunch of uh, stupid vacation photos in my talk. <laughs> 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 
there are bugs. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, the, you know, debugging and failure avoidance are really synergistic. They go together. So, okay. So I'm going to start this section of my talk with an example that shows you at a high level how our system works. But first, I'm going to talk about how things work today. When you develop software today, you have your development and debugging system. You make your application, and then you push it out to the deployed systems like this. The deployed systems run, and sometimes they get one of these uh, thread interleavings that leads to a failure. So this might be a concurrency bug. And if you're a good developer, you collect a core dump, and you have that sent back to your development and debugging box. And with the core dump in hand, you can spend time trying to come up with a patch and figure out what went wrong with the program. The interesting thing about this is the developer is active but the deployed systems are passive in this process, just waiting for a patch to come from the developer. Um, in the meantime, the deployed systems might experience the same failure over again, um, degrading the reliability of the community of systems. So in this work, we had the idea to make the deployed systems uh, be active in this process as well. Um, we make them cooperate by sharing information to learn why failures happen and what they can do to avoid those failures in future program executions. OK, so now I'm going to give you an overview of what things look like if we have a Viso, which is our system that takes advantage of that idea. So just like you have a development and debugging server, we have an Aviso server. In the deployed systems, we see that the application is linked against the Aviso runtime, which runs on the same machines as the uh, application itself. We see that same failure. And just like we sent a core dump back in the baseline system, in the, the case with Aviso, we send an event history back to the Aviso server. Aviso does some analysis on that event history and says, uh, and uh, the information that it extracts from that analysis uh, goes into building a model of what happened in that failure, what happened preceding that failure. And it's important to note that this is a cooperative model. Anytime a failure happens over here, it ships an event history over to the Aviso server and contributes to that model. So nodes are cooperating, deployed system nodes are cooperating by sharing information. Using the cooperative failure model, the Aviso server generates constraints on the execution schedule of the program that restrict certain, uh, the order of certain events in different threads. And when Aviso finds a constraint that prevents a failure, it ships it back across to the deployed systems. The deployed systems can use those constraints to avoid failures. And note that if one node fails and has a constraint sent to it, that same constraint can be sent to all the other machines trivially. And they can share the wealth of failure avoidance. So are these constraints guarantees, or are they probabilistic? I'll show you. I'm going to get to that. Yeah. Um, so there are three parts to the system. The first is, what are constraints and how do they work? Um, and the second is, uh, what are the event histories that we collect? And how do we use the information in the event histories to generate constraints? Finally, I'm going to talk about what goes into that cooperative failure model, and how is it useful for picking which constraints are going to avoid bugs. So first, I'll talk about these uh, schedule constraints. Um, to talk about these, I need to show you a little bit more code. This code is really simple, though. There are two threads. You have the green thread. It's doing something funny, which is set this variable to null and then set it to a new object. So it does two operations. Blue thread is acquiring a lock and then using that pointer that green is playing with over there and then releasing the lock. So this program is broken in several ways. Um, we can talk about them yeah, at length. Uh, and the important thing to know, though, is that if it executes under this interleaving, blue uses the null pointer because green set it to null and then blue used it. Um, and that's a problem. Um, the way to understand this bug is that uh, this bug is characterized by the event ordering that I've indicated with those dashed arrows. When p, hap p equals null happens and then p pointer use happens, um, we get the failure. Only if p pointer use precedes the assignment of p to that new uh, variable. We can also observe that if we had a different ordering of events, like p equals null followed by assignment of p to the new pointer and then the use of p, well, that wouldn't lead to a failure. So the key, one of the key ideas in this work is to shift the execution away from failing schedules like the one on the previous slide and toward non-failing schedules like the one on this slide. To do that, we developed the idea of a schedule constraint. And a schedule constraint says uh, that a pair of operations contribute to a failure and reordering around those operations can prevent that failure. So a schedule constraint is really nothing more than a pair of instructions in the execution. And the semantics of a schedule constraint are very simple. We have a con schedule constraint like this, and it has the green instruction and the blue instruction. The semantics are the following. When in the execution, we reach that first instruction, the constraint gets activated. Subsequently, in the execution, when we reach that second instruction, the blue one, that instruction gets delayed. 
Those are the semantics of a schedule constraint. And now, I'm going to show you with that example why this is actually effective at, the, at avoiding failures. It's effective because uh, in this example, you can see that p equals null gets executed. That activates the schedule constraint. Then, p pointer use tries to execute. Normally, that would cause a failure. But instead, the constraint delays the execution of that operation. In the meantime, green steps in, executes its p equals new p. And later, after that delay expires, blue gets to execute its operation without failing. Why do you express it in terms of delay as opposed to sort of you know, thinking of the second green instruction as enabling mm -hmm. the uh, blue instruction to continue? That's a really great question. So why don't we just figure out what instruction this is and make constraints that have all three of those instructions, right? Well, no, I would just. OK, yeah. Yeah, something like that. Um, the main reason is, uh, you'll recall from the previous example, that the failure occurred at this instruction. And so if we want to do forensic analysis in our server, we don't know that this instruction exists. We have an event history, and I'll show you in a second what, what kind of event history we, histories we keep. And the event history doesn't say anything about p equals new p. But you have the code of the program. We have the code of the program. And something I'm looking at in future work is doing a better job of tuning these delays based on predictions of which instructions might, uh, might be good constraint deactivators. Yeah. Okay. These are dynamic instructions. Say again? These constraints refer to dynamic instructions or uh, static, static instructions? Static instructions. Const uh, a constraint is a pair of static program instructions. And when a dynamic instance of the first instruction in the pair occurs, it activates the constraint. And when an active constraint is, uh, when a constraint is active and the second uh, instruction executes, then uh, that causes a delay like this. In any thread. Say again? I mean, those instructions could occur in any thread, right? Yeah, so if a constraint is active, because the first instruction executed in one thread, uh, in any thread except the one that activated the constraint. Oh, so in, in, not in the same thread, but okay. in, in any other thread. Yeah, otherwise, you'd get some atomic region that prevented itself from proceeding, because, yeah. So, so how long have you delayed? So I'm worried about a scenario where this causes timeouts and it cascades with the system, and you have even worse behavior. Yeah, so that's a problem. The delays are fairly short, on the order of uh, hundreds of instructions. Um, and we did a characterization of the uh, delay time. We, we established this empirically. Um, one of the things I want to do in the future is do a better job of figuring out how long those delays should be and if there are program events, uh, as Jim pointed out, program events that we could use to trigger expiration of a delay instead. Um, but we did this empirically, and we found a, a range of, uh, uh, that the range of failures that we were dealing with in our experiments uh, fit into a particular delay window. So that's an area of, uh, I want to look at in future work. What if there was a, some other constraint between those two green instructions that decided to delay the allocation of P to satisfy some other constraint, right? So then they, these two delays would cancel mm -hmm. each other. Yeah. And so, so you would not prevent the model. Right. So the situation is where you, you essentially end up with live lock because delays cascade between threads. Not so. a live lock in which, because you're using delays, they just cancel out because. You have two different constraints there inserting mm. delays that just cancel each other. Right. So, so, so yeah, yeah, I agree. This is problematic. One delay could undo the good of another. Um, so the good news is you're only as bad as the program was initially. Um, the bad news is that means that this mechanism doesn't actually work. Uh, another answer to that question is that I'm actually trying to work on a formalism right now um, that shows that as long as delays are acyclic, and the hard part is defining what acyclicity is for these kinds of things, then you can't end up with situations where delays cause live lock, or in, in the way you described it, is un undo one another's work. So. But I don't agree with your statement here. Only as bad as the original execution. Yeah. Introducing <laughs> delay that kind of causes yeah. like, plus, you know, plus performance worse, degradation. Yeah. Yeah. With performance degradation, yeah. you're right. So there is an impact on latency. We did find in our uh, evaluation of this that delays are very infrequent, however. Um, and that's a property of the applications that we looked at. Um, so you're right to say that if delays happen very frequently, this could be increasing latencies and causing timeouts and bad things to happen. Um, in practice, we found that's not the case. And furthermore, uh, in our model for selected constraints, which I'm going to talk about in just a couple minutes, um, we can build in uh, a quality of service constraint that says don't use schedule constraints that degrade quality of service, meaning cause timeouts, cause uh, un unacceptable increase in, in uh, request latency, things like that. Yeah, no, but, but it's not just latency, right? You're adding a delay. So what you're doing is you're biasing the schedules to a subset of schedules. 
and those schedules could kind of cause, well, cause that, you to expose yeah. other bugs that so, you wouldn't. Mm -hmm. and, you know, that's a very scary. pessimistic view. I mean, the I'm reason we're doing this is because, <laughs> yeah, the, no, the, well, the reason we're doing this is to bias the schedule away from schedules that right. we think are going to cause bugs. Yes, but you don't know that in advance, so you could be kind of, yeah. you have no guarantee. It's, or it's, it's true, but I think that that's an incredibly pessimistic view. That's saying that when you go to avoid one bug, you're going to land on another bug. I, I just, I think so, it's possible. Show me also what it's called. Yeah. Like. <laughs> This might be one place where Shaz's uh, recommendation might, might okay. actually might work. Like yeah. You can think of there being an implicit invariant that P is not now before the use. Right? Mm -hmm. And so what you do at runtime is that you evaluate that invariant, and if it fails, mm -hmm. you know you're going to crash. So rather than crashing the program, you just delay for the You hang the string. Yeah. And then evaluate it again. And hopefully, yeah. you yeah. this true again, <laughs> and then you just run. Right? That actually that sounds might like be a sure way of like you know avoiding all these problems. You're about to crash, rather than crashing, you know you're actually making the program. The problem is having the specification. We we but don't. But here you have an implicit yeah. specification, right? Because Mahan is saying there's an implicit null de uh, reference there, right? Mm. So you can generate the uh, yeah. null de reference right. specification. Or yeah. actually, you're right. The, 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 if it was Java, you'd have the null test before the de reference. That's true. You could even you could even instrument this. Yeah. Oh, we should collaborate on that kind of project in the future. I like that idea. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. So in the you're talking about the question of how do we identify failures? I'm saying in the benchmarks, the, yeah. you said in practice this happens rarely, but what, what is it that goes wrong in practice? Is it null dereferences or is it we got the wrong answer because something you referenced wrong in one reference? Yeah, I touched on this point before you came in. So the, the way that we identify failures is actually looking for fail stop conditions, assertion failures and, and segmentation faults and signals and things. Um, in general, finding failures is a hard problem, and, and predicting when something has gone wrong is, is unsolved, and I, I think a, a cool thing to look at in the future. So, sure. Yeah. So could you maybe try different values of, of the delay in, in production mm -hmm. and mo monitor the effects this has on maybe the, the latency that you're seeing? You can, and, and that would... End-to-end -end latency? You can, and that would increase the search space, because you'd have to try tuples of pairs of... Uh, tuples of constraint and delay time. Um, but it's well, feasible. This yeah. Without. Uh, okay. Right. Right. Yeah. But so, you'll see when I get to the, the when I get to my discussion of the, the model. Smallest, the, you know, I guess. Yeah. The largest delay that has no effect on the end-to-end -end system, right? Something like that. Right. That's certainly what you want. And uh, when I get to the model, I can talk a little for, for a, a second about how we could incorporate that information into the model. So you can certainly just uh, send out a variety of constraints with different delays to each. If you have a large collection of systems, right? You can kind of in parallel search the space effectively yeah. by running different delays. Have you seen my talk before? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, this is this is central. This is central to the way the technique works. So yeah. Um, so uh, something I mentioned before is that the way we generate these constraints is by collecting a history of events that happened before the failure, and we use that information to generate constraints. And I'm going to talk about what goes into those histories and how we collect that information. So if we uh, have a program like this, we need to instrument events that are interesting when we're trying to deal with concurrency bugs. And there are two kinds of events that we think are interesting. One is synchronization events, and the other is sharing events. Synchronization is locks and unlocks, thread spawns and joins, things like that. And these are easy to find with a compiler, and if there's custom synchronization or something like that, the programmer can tell our system, this is what I'm using for synchronization. Um, sharing events are memory operations that access memory locations that could be shared across threads. It's harder to find. So the way we do that is by using a profiler, because using a compiler, we have to be conservative, and it's hard to identify a, a reasonably small set of sharing events in the execution. So once we've found sharing events and synchronization events, we have a compiler pass that inserts calls into our runtime, into the program. Um, and those runtime calls um, are uh, used to populate the event history that I described before. So the event history is a data structure that exists in the runtime uh, while, the program, uh, while the program executes. Um, and when the execution unfolds, we see the event history gets p equals null, because that's an event. And then we see this acquired lock. Uh, and then we see p pointer use. Um, and then we see a failure. Aviso also monitors for failures. And it considers assertion failures, uh, signal uh, terminating signal deliveries, and, and things like that, fail stop conditions um, to be indicators of failures. And like I said a second ago, we're looking at other ways of identifying failures. So after the program fails, we have this event history that shows what happened leading up to the failure. Then we want to generate a set of constraints that are candidates for preventing that failure behavior that occurred. We do that by enumerating all the possible pairs of instructions in a window of that event history that executed in different threads. 
So in the toy example event history here, we have uh, two different constraints that we can generate. The p equals null in the acquire lock, and the p equals null in the p pointer use. And you'll remember this is the one from a second ago that I showed actually works to avoid that failure by adding a delay. Um, okay, now I've just showed you how we can generate a set of constraints. Um, but I didn't tell you how we decide which one is actually useful for avoiding the failure. So that's the last part of my talk, is Aviso gets a bunch of failures, builds, the mo builds up a big set of constraints, and then it needs to decide which ones it wants to send over to the deployed systems so they can use it to avoid failures. Which one does it pick? To answer that question, we develop a constraint selection model. Our constraint selection model has two parts. The first part is the event pair model. And the second part is the failure feedback model. The event pair model looks at pairs of events that occur in the program's execution, and in particular, how frequently pairs of events occur in non-failing portions of the execution. To get that information, Aviso sparsely samples event histories from non-failing execution. The intuition behind why this is useful is, if a pair of events happens often in a correct portion of the execution, then it's unlikely to be responsible for the failure. So trying to reorder around those events isn't likely to have any impact on, on whether the failure manifests or not. The other side of the model is the failure feedback model. This model gets populated when we start issuing constraints out to deployed systems. It explicitly tracks the impact on the failure rate of the system when a particular constraint is active and when no constraints are active. So the intuition here is that if a constraint uh, if the instance of a constraint being used by a system cor uh, correlates with a decrease in the failure rate, then that constraint is more likely to be useful in future executions for avoiding the failure. We have a way of combining that information together that I'm not going to describe in detail um, into the, a combined model that is a probability distribution defined over the set of all the constraints that we have, and Aviso draws constraints according to that probability distribution and issues them to the deployed systems. So if anyone's a machine learning person in the audience, this is an instance of reinforcement lead learning, um, and it's a variant of the K-armed bandit model for reinforcement learning. Yep. So how many failures do you need to see for that feedback model to actually be useful? So because you only get yeah. one sample, one data point, right, per one crash? Yeah. That, okay. That's right, yeah. So uh, we found in our experiments that it's relatively few, 10 mm -hmm. to 100, and we start to see the feedback having an impact on which constraint is drawn. So in a way, you can think about this model as being predictive. We have an infinite amount of correct execution data, and then a failure happens. So this predictive model says which pairs of events aren't likely to be useful. So we discard those as much as we can. But we have some that we either don't have enough information about or are actually useful for preventing the bug. So we use the prediction. already too late, sort of, that if, if it, it's crashes a, occur, then by the time they, you know, it's a pretty big emergency, maybe. I don't know. I'm just. Yeah, it might be a pretty big emergency, but it doesn't <laughs> fix the program. I mean, if the. No, if they, I know, but I mean, maybe at that point, like, there's 10 people working on it, and they might fix it and deploy it. Um. So there's an anecdote. This is. Uh, time is becoming an issue, but there is an anecdote that I like to uh, talk about, and this is something I saw on the Memcached developer board. Um, they had this bug, and it was open for a year. Um, and it was a lost update that uh, triggered an assertion failure at some point later. Um, and the developers saw the bug report and then decided to ignore it because they said fixing this would introduce a 7% performance overhead. So it stayed open for a year. Who knows how many people using Memcached experienced this bug, saw that their server went down and then restarted the stupid thing. Eventually enough bug reports came in that they actually went and finished it, uh, fi uh, fixed the bug a year later. Uh, submitted a patch with the 7% performance degradation. In contrast, our system was able to fix that bug with a 15% performance overhead, which I'll show you later, um, and it did it in the space of 10 to 100 executions, rather than the number of executions that pr had bug reports submitted for them in the space of a year. So that kind of helps to, to tune the, the time frame uh, for how bugs get dealt with. And in general, bugs can stay open for multiple years. It's, a year could be generous for some open source packages that are pretty widely used. It's like millions of dollars right there. Lost it could be. I mean, I, we, that, that's hard to quantify, but I mean, it's, it's a, yeah. Say again? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, so the information we're collecting um, says a lot about why the bug happened. So send it back to developers. They can use this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, some are. I mean. My question's off topic, so changing So mine was just like, you know, you, you put this FBI in 60 seconds, a city bank window. So what your stuff is doing is you're reducing the window to maybe 45 seconds. I'd rather shut the program down, <laughs> not let people. I don't understand you. What, what is the window that you mean? So, so there was the one of the three things you motivated in your talk was I think you know there was this 
casino robbery. Yeah. This guy is exploiting this race or something. Yeah. Like yeah. Sixty second window, they could download more <coughs> So what you are think presumably you might do is you know shrink the size of that window but still keep it open, as opposed to someone noticing or detecting and just shutting the system down. Unless there was some way of identifying that the, that a failure or an something attack was taking place. Away. Yes. Just, it's better sometimes to just shut it down, right? Uh, are, are you saying that? But for that, yeah. uh, right, he's trying for, to stop. Right? Okay. To, to keep the system available in the case of fail stop bugs, this is definitely, it, I, mean, I think this is a, a better option than letting the system crash if availability is the most important thing. Right, but I'm saying that sometimes availability sometimes it's not, is the yeah. wrong metric, right? But That's there are times where you absolutely kind of true. want to sacrifice availability because yeah. it's the worst to be available. Mm -hmm. Even in the case of security bugs, um, this can still be useful, and I think especially when combined with techniques for identifying that. Um, something anomalous is happening in the execution. I haven't done that work yet, but if you, if you think about a, a technique that says, hey, an attack might be happening, maybe we can use a mechanism like this in combination with something like that to keep the system available and to close the security hole. I, th I think that's something interesting to think about. I think this is great for like a staging yeah. area or a test bed where you can of wire This is the life cycle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, uh, so you and I are going to lunch, so I think we can delay it as much cool. as we yeah, do. Do you want to? Talk about this lunch maybe because I, I have a few more slides in it. Sure. I'm afraid people are. <laughs> I'm afraid people are going to start leaving because it is 20 minutes to 12 now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, what, what, <laughs> Please start. One, one piece of information that you don't seem to use is yeah. that uh, in correct executions, uh, something, hap some, something happens in correct executions, which doesn't happen in incorrect in executions. So you don't have to worry about that here. Right. We have half of that information, but we don't, we don't have, have that half. We don't have the other half. Right. Right. So we can incorporate information from failing event histories into our predictive model, but I haven't done that because I couldn't come up with a way that reliably produced good predictions. It, it's just it's a hard problem because you have you also have a data sparsity problem because you only see you see fewer failing executions than you see correct executions, and there are lots of events in a program, and so for some of those events you don't have you don't have uh, information from the failing executions, which makes it a hard thing to do to incorporate that information. Yeah. So so here you're approximating a dynamic instance with its static IP address, right? In, in yes. You're not adding any context. We have no, it, it's context and, insensitive. And so have you thought about adding more context, like your know, context aware I have. stuff, and see if it, does it actually improve the failure? Prediction? So call stack information would eliminate some spurious delays, um, but collecting it is expensive. I mean, it, it, it adds overhead to collect the call stack information. But you're sampling anyway, right? So you can collect a lot more. Uh, no, we're not sampling. So uh, in order to... In order to activate a constraint, we would need to know that a particular instruction executing in a call stack was happening. So we would need to do a check that computed the call stack at each activation point. So. Cool. Um, our implementation is simpler than this slide uh, makes it seem. Uh, there are three parts, the runtime, the compiler and profiler, uh, and the server. Compiler and profiler, uh, the profiler was written in PIN. Compiler we wrote as a pass for LLVM, and it takes a, uh, it takes a responsibility for finding and instrumenting events, and linking to the runtime. Um, the important thing about the interaction between the runtime and the server is that they exchange event histories, and they exchange uh, schedule constraints. And the, uh, the, the server uh, maintains the model of how to draw constraints. And they communicate over HTTP, so the system is portable in implementation. You can put it anywhere, and it's not, uh, it doesn't need to be on a single machine, for example. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about how we evaluated our system. Our goal, my goal in the evaluation is to convince you that uh, we measurably decrease failure rates in uh, our experiments with some real applications, um, and that our technique has uh, overheads which are reasonable, especially when availability is the key concern. Um, our setup was to use a small cluster of machines that all ran the application, and we had a single Aviso server, um, and we used a set of uh, benchmarks that partially overlaps with the ones I used um, in the previous study. Um, Memcached, and Apache, and uh, Transmission were the biggest applications we looked at. So here's a summary, a very high-level summary of the results. Um, for, some of the, uh, for one of the applications, we had a reduction in failure rate of 85 times. That was a failure in the PHP processing subsystem of Apache HTTPD. Um, and we saw, yeah, 85 times decrease in the failure rate. So it happened 85 times less frequently. So that's one bug. This is one bug. Just avoid hitting it. And it was hit that frequently. 
Uh, that's correct. I mean, that frequently was over a humongous space. In our experiments, we used hundreds of billions of requests hitting these systems. So it was a very large space of execution um, that we looked at. Did you have any execution where you, had, you were actually avoiding multiple bugs? Yeah, so we had a study that didn't make it into the paper where we took uh, two different bugs in a version of Apache um, and we showed that we can avoid them. And the, the key to that is that we have schedule constraints um, and we need to decide if it's the same bug happening or a different one. Um, and we do that by fingerprinting bugs based on the event history that preceded the failure. So doing that, we can send one constraint for each bug that we've fingerprinted and we can, we can solve that problem. It didn't make it into the paper, but we, we showed that it does work without increasing overhead um, as like the product of the, the delay, uh, the overheads. So. Um, the average case overhead uh, was about 15 times decrease in the rate of manifestation of the failures. Um, and the overheads that we saw were uh, practical, especially if uh, avail uh, availability is the most important thing. Um, there were overheads as low as 5% uh, when we were monitoring the execution and using delays to avoid failures, and the average overhead was around 20%. Um, so uh, these are overheads that are acceptable in production systems, like I said, especially when latency is not the highest priority and availability is more important. Okay, so there were, uh, just to wrap up this section, schedule constraints are the new abstraction that we introduced. We have support in compiler, runtime, and we have a statistical model at the application level. Um, there are, uh, this is a system that's useful. Uh, for the system's lifetime uh, because it actually helps deployed systems be more reliable um, and it takes advantage of collective behavior by sampling information from many deployed systems. So that's it for the two projects that I was going to drill down into. Um, this has been just awesome to have this many questions. I really appreciate it. Um, usually, yeah, it can get dry to give this talk a million times. So, <laughs> uh, so now I'm going to move on and uh, in like three minutes talk about some future work and then I'll take more questions afterwards if there are still people that are wondering things. Um, so in the future, I'm interested uh, in continuing work in the direction of reliability um, and in looking at uh, adapting some of these techniques to energy efficiency and I'm also looking um, at some emerging architectures, uh, which I think are interesting. So I'm going to talk about those now. Um, to start with, though, uh, this is a picture of the way that I think computer systems are being built today, and I think it's getting worse. Um, so we have multi-cores, and in order to get good performance out of a multi-core or a data center, you have to put a lot of burden on the programmer to get that programming right so that we get reliable execution. And the burden is primarily on the programmer to go and avoid crashes, just like this guy on the bike needs to. Is that also in Zimbabwe? No, that's not. This is stock art. This is stock art from the internet. Where? <laughs> this is stock art from the internet. I just I found this photo. <laughs> I thought it was funny. So this guy gets uh, brick level parallelism, um, but he pays for it in that he has to carefully stack these bricks on his bicycle. Um, and he gets good performance, but it's, it's really hard. Um, so I think we need to address the reliability problem. In the past, we've been focusing a lot on the performance problem. And I think the problem is getting worse as we move toward uh, heterogeneous architectures where the programming problem is going to be more complicated. Um, when, we're, when we're addressing reliability and performance, we need to keep in mind complexity. And we need to balance where complexity ends up in a system. Does it end up in the architecture or the compiler or the language or in the programmer's hands or wherever? We need to keep that in mind when we're coming up with solutions. So one thrust of my future work is going to be to continue to look at reliability. Reliability is the problem that I've been talking about. And in fact, I think that as the, the performance benefits of uh, Moore's law are petering out because of the utilization wall and the power wall, um, we're going to need to find other ways of uh, adding value to platforms. And this is especially interesting to companies, but I think that this is interesting in general. And one way that I think that uh, is a really promising uh, way to do that um, is to add features to architectures and systems that improve reliability all the time. And I described two of them today, one that has hardware mechanisms and another that's a software layer. So I think there's a big opportunity to research and reliability. One idea in particular that I, I'm really interested in is the idea of decoupling the process of developing software from the reliability of the software. Aviso is a really early example of this. You're taking some of the responsibility for avoiding failures out of the hands of the programmer. One area where I think this is especially interesting is in shared resource platforms like cloud applications and in mobile applications. Um, so I think of uh, the process as hardening applications in these kinds of platforms. The programmer doesn't see anything different, they just deploy the software. The user doesn't see anything different, they just get software as it's distributed. Some interesting points related to how we can take advantage of shared infrastructure. Can you the so Is it about the cats? At least in this company, <laughs> yeah. I've never seen that anybody would care so much about reliability, especially if nothing is visible at either end. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, if the user doesn't see any uh, 
perceptible benefit, right? Why would why would a company invest in reliability? They see it by comparison to other platforms. So you have all sorts of reviews on it. Just take mobile space for an example. You have a Android versus iPhone. Okay. And if I'm an end user and I'm saying, well, which phone do I want to buy the next version of? Well, you can look at Android and you can look at, look at iPhone and say, which one has uh, more crashes? And then you can go and buy a Microsoft Windows phone or something like that. And so well, this one has fewer crashes because someone baked something into the software or runtime layers to improve the reliability. And that could actually. This has never happened in the it's never happened. Of I totally agree with you. And it's never happened because people have focused on making performance better in subsequent or generations. Features. Huh? Or features, no what, features. But what are features are essentially performance. Features are things like vector processing, and that gets performance. And features are things like better optimizing compilers, it's for performance. So I think reliability. No? no? Features are features on your phone. Yeah, yeah some, some oh, things. Like, yeah. You know, I mm -hmm. want to talk to my phone. You know, I so, want to do some pictures. Sure. Sure. I think actually the argument against that is we spend an enormous amount of money on testing uh, <coughs> in, in our software. The, the other argument is we expose Dr. Watson to developers now, right? If you're on Windows, one of the value adds is you can get crash and sent to Microsoft, and then we expose those to you so your app can be more reliable. Right. So I think that because you have shared resource platforms like that, you can, you can do things like you just described. And Aviso and like what you just described is only the very beginning. And I think there's a lot of other opportunities. Um, and so this shows some of the advantages to looking at these platforms and some of the opportunities that are there. One is that you have the common infrastructure. So you don't need to boil the ocean. If you want to push a new testing tool or a new optimization technique or a new failure avoidance technique, load it into the platform and you get it. Everyone has to use it. You have control over the hardware. So if you get header, if you, you find that you can uh, get uh, easier, uh, the, simplify the programming problem using some heterogeneous hardware for solving some problems, or uh, you can get better performance, you have control over the hardware and the environment. You have massive scale. So those models, like I showed, the statistical models that we use in Recon and in Aviso, uh, they improve when you have more data. And you'll have lots of data if you're looking at a cloud system. We can also make systems that do uh, something similar to what Avisa does, and that is to make changes to the way that they behave experimentally. Some of those changes might turn out bad, but if one of those changes turns out to be really good, then that change can be shared with all the other systems on that platform. And I think that's a really cool idea. And finally, I think it's interesting to look at how uh, we can use a model of behavior built in one system, and we can transfer the, the information over to another system. So what can we learn? about Windows by looking at Linux, for example? Are there things at some level of abstraction that will transfer usefully uh, between those systems? And I, I think that there are. It's going to require changes to the system. We're going to need uh, new uh, primitives for introspecting into the behavior of the system, uh, things related to concurrency like coherence, um, sequences of events potentially from different threads, exposing that up in an efficient way to uh, runtime layers or to the developer is going to be a challenge, and energy, which is a problem on everyone's mind, especially in the mobile space. Um, I want to look at new mechanisms for failure avoidance. You'll notice that there was no hardware support in Aviso. Um, but Aviso, one of the challenges that it has to overcome is the overhead of enforcing those constraints. And I think with hardware support, we could do a better job of that. So I think changing uh, lower levels of the system, whether actually in hardware or not, um, is an interesting thing to look at when dealing with uh, failure avoidance. And also looking not just at concurrent programs, but at, at sequential programs as well. I also think another way to deal with this problem, uh, that, uh, the, the problem that programming is so difficult, is to just do the programming for the programmer. So looking at synthesis techniques. I'm working on a project with some natural language processing researchers right now where we mined a bunch of code from the internet, and we're looking at ways of incorporating that into um, an active learning-based code synthesis engine. Um, the last idea I want to talk about is that um, power failures impact reliability. If you have a platform that experiences power failures, often that's a reliability issue. So energy efficiency is a form of being reliable. I'm especially interested in this area in the domain of small and uh, unpowered devices. Intel has a little device called WISP. Um, and this was developed in collaboration with several people from, uh, from academia. And it's a very interesting device because it doesn't have a battery. The way that it powers itself is by harvesting ambient radio frequency energy, charging a supercapacitor, and as the supercapacitor discharges, it does a little bit of computation. That's a really interesting platform because it requires interruption tolerance during the execution. Power failures go from being the once in a while event where someone kicks the plug out of the wall to being maybe 10 or 100 times every second, depending on the size of the capacitor and the rate of the computation. That fundamentally changes the way that you design what is an operating system, how do you program devices like this, 
maybe we want to treat power failures as recoverable exceptions. What would be the system layers that be required to do that? So I think this is really uh, an interesting problem to look at, especially as these devices find use in more ubiquitous computing applications. Um, and I also think that looking at ways of avoiding power failures by, for example, uh, trading off a failure due to, trading off uh, energy related failures uh, and program reliability mechanisms. A program reliability, me re reliability mechanism is like a null check. If you can elide a null check to save enough energy to keep the system alive, you might want to do that. But you only want to decide to do that when it's really important. So you'd have to have some introspection on how much ener energy remains um, and how you can make that trade off dynamically um, is an interesting, uh, interesting question. I'm going to skip this last bullet um, and just point out that there's lots of cool applications for this stuff um, with people working in health and environmental sciences, especially in the Northwest. We have lots of forestry and water resource re uh, research. Um, and there's lots of uh, interesting health applications that would be relevant to a company like Microsoft, um, especially working with these small devices and how they're programmed and things like that. So I think there's a lot of really interesting and visible uh, opportunities for collaboration and applications there. Okay, so that's my talk. Um, there's a big list of collaborators that I've worked with uh, over the years at UW, uh, as well as uh, several people from Microsoft Research and HP Labs and IBM. Um, and I really appreciate you giving me your attention and asking so many questions. And I'll take more questions in the last five minutes if there are any. All right, any more questions? I think so. <laughs> cool. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is great.